Great, so that's structural causal models. And if you remember from the Bractor criterion, there was a second part to it, which was that we shouldn't condition on descendants of treatment. And we've waited to define structural causal models before going more into that part of the backdoor criterion, but now that we've done so, we will go into that part. So there are a few reasons why we don't want to condition on descendants of treatment. The first, we don't need structural causal models for, we can just look at the graph. We want to measure the effect of treatment on outcome, T on Y. And in this graph, if we condition on M, we're going to block all of the causal association from T to Y. We're going to mistakenly measure a causal effect of zero because we've blocked all of the causal association by conditioning on M. And it doesn't need to be that we block all of the causal association. For example, in this graph, there is association flowing directly from T to Y that doesn't go through M. So when we condition on M, we only block part of the causal association. Okay, so that's one reason why we don't want to condition on descendants of treatment. Another is that we might induce new post-treatment association. So in this graph, if we condition on Z, then because Z is a collider, we will induce new association between T and Y that is not causal association. Because this non-causal association comes from a collider, this is commonly known as collider bias. How about in this graph, where Z is a descendant of a mediator M here? Is it okay to condition on Z here? It doesn't look like it will block any causal association like we would be doing if we were to condition on M. It turns out that the answer here is no, it's not okay to condition on Z. And to see why, we are going to magnify the causal graph. So if you remembered, I mentioned that the unobserved variables are commonly not drawn in the causal graph, and we'll refer to magnification as the process of showing these unobserved variables. So if we show the unobserved variable for M, we see that M is actually a collider, and conditioning on the child of this collider will actually induce new association. You can actually think of this new association as getting tangled up with the causal association that's flowing from T to M to Y. This new association gets tangled up right here, and that's the problem. That's where we get collider bias. This part is actually why we waited until after we defined SCMs, because now we have this unobserved variable U sub M, which was key here because it's what created the V structure or immorality. So to avoid inducing new post-treatment association, a common rule to follow is just don't condition on post-treatment covariates. And this rule you'll see everywhere, even in the potential outcomes literature, and this is exactly what the second part of the backdoor criterion states. There are instances where you can condition on post-treatment covariates without inducing bias, and we discussed that briefly in the corresponding section of the course book. However, even if we don't condition on post-treatment covariates, we still can observe collider bias. So here is an example which is known as M bias because of the M shape that it creates. So Z2 could be pretreatment here, where pretreatment means that it precedes treatment in time. And if we were to condition on this pretreatment covariate Z2, we would observe collider bias, or more specifically, M bias. If you want to see many real world examples of collider bias, go ahead and check out Elwert in Winship. 2014. We've now reached the end of the structural causal model section, so I'll leave you with these three questions to answer. Go ahead and pause now if you want to take some time to do that. 